I'm on my beloved K100 RS. My 1986 K100 RS to be precise. And this is going to be an impressions video. So let's get to it. And what a beautiful day it is! Absolutely glorious. It's a Sunday. We're at the beginning of May. The sun is out. And I'm in the peaks. Which is a bit of a running theme. Alright, so the plan for today's ride is a pretty much the standard route, but it's one of my favourites. It's uh oh hello Mr. Biker. It's to head out to the Yonderman. I'm gonna grab myself a coffee or a tea or something out there. And I'd still uh, really enjoy that ride out there. It's only about an hour or so from my house. And uh, you get to have all of this, which is phenomenal. Absolutely brilliant. So yeah, uh, head out to the Yonderman, uh, go down to Buxton. It's one of my little uh, favourite rides at the moment. Ticks a lot of boxes and makes me very happy. <laughs> so yes, the K100RS. I can't tell you how much I love this bike, It's I just absolutely adore it. And for so many reasons too. Now I've had this bike for about a year, or no, over a year now. I'd say probably about 14, 15 months. And in that first 12 months, it was all about work on it. As it was a project, and it still, still is. And uh, I got it in February 2018. Oh, it's a Ferrari. Uh, yeah, February 2018 is when I picked it up. It came from Scotland. And Keith went all the way up there to get it for me and bring it all the way back because he's a good man. And the reason I got it was uh, was twofold. Uh, one, I needed something to keep me busy while I was off the bike. My uh, my my maths on that was that if I couldn't ride, I'd better find a bike that I can work on, you know, to keep me uh, keep me occupied during those 12 months. And on that level, it certainly did the trick. And uh, on the other level, uh, the reason why it was this bike, uh, among, uh, you know, against any others, was that uh, Keith had them, and Keith actually has one the same colour as this, uh, but it's a little bit, uh, a little bit older. I think it's a couple of years older than mine. And uh, I uh, remember sitting on that the Christmas before I lost my license, and uh, realising, you know what, I could ride this bike. This bike works. And I kind of liked it right, right from the, the get-go. I liked the big square headlamp, I loved the fairing, and uh, I loved that engine. But uh, more on that later. So yeah, picked up that bike, brought it back on a trailer. We should have a picture of it somewhere, and if I have, I'll put it up on the screen. And uh, it sat in my garage for, uh, for a little while during uh, those initial winter months before I started working on it. And I should indicate at this point, it was through a lot of help from uh, Team Mapped and friends. But let's uh, fast forward a bit. So it's probably around uh, March, I would say. Maybe the beginning of April. Hello, Mr. Fireblade. Uh, when work really started to kick off and I started to do my research and due diligence on this bike. It's history, the forums, uh, where to get parts, and, uh, and finalising the plans for it too. Because for a while, I was thinking about doing a, doing a custom job on it. As it's uh, become quite the bike for, uh, for customs. And again, more on that in a bit. But I decided 
through my budget, my facilities I've got at my house and my garage and my knowledge of bikes in general, it'd be best to keep it original and uh, to restore it the best I could to a running, usable bike. So I wasn't talking about concourse conditions here, I wasn't talking about taking it into uh, competitions, far from it. It was about getting the bike to a standard which I was happy with and that I could use it as a viable bike, as a second option to my GS. And when I got it, there was a number of things that were glaringly bad, or bad with it, uh, from my point of view. Um, and that was first off the fairing. Uh, the, all the fairing on the front of the bike was busted. It had clearly been dropped um, and had some kind of, uh, some kind of incident, because all the fairing on the left had been busted and scraped, as well as the right. I can't remember which side was worse now, but one of them was worse off. And you can still see that on the, the mirror housings. So that was the first thing. Second was the seat. It had a massive, massive uh, cut all the way uh, from the middle of it all the way down and it had been covered with gaffer tape. So that was uh, another thing that had to be done. And uh, yeah, a lot of other things like the badges on the bike were all uh, peeling, had been in the sun for too long and the, uh, we're just, we're not like, looking great. They were looking more uh, yellow, yellowy orange than they were white and blue. And uh, yeah, it didn't have uh, the panniers either. And uh, yeah, a lot of other things like that. So uh, that's where the, the project really started for me, was when I was reaching out on the forums and connecting to the, to the network of people out there. And I really enjoyed it. So I started finding out more and more about the bike and the community out there is fantastic for recommendations, uh, previous experiences, things not to bother with, things to bother with. It was brilliant. And uh, then work began. I managed to find the fairing first off. And there was a great site in the, the UK uh, called uh, Sherlock's. I'll put a link below. And uh, that place is just a source of all things BMW across the, across the years. And of course that includes the uh, K100. And through that site I managed to find the whole front fairing uh, for the bike. Including a headlamp, which I didn't need but it came with it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think I picked that up for £100. I was so excited when that came, I'm telling you, I was bouncing off the walls. After that, I got all the badges, then a replacement seat cover, that was only a tenner, which was an absolute steal, and the panniers, I'm really proud of the panniers, they came all the way from Germany, I found those on eBay, and again, I got those for a hundred quid, and the th special thing about the fairing, no, the fairing, sorry, the, the panniers, is that I, I got them and they came with the racks all for a hundred quid both of them two panniers and the racks and, uh, and a whole bunch of uh, bolts from a really nice guy that I bought it from and uh, I was looking around on eBay and some of these uh, panniers were going for around 80 to 90 uh, oh dear something's gone on here oh no that's blue flashing lights up there Oh no, it's been some kind of accident, that's awful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as I was saying, 80 to 90 pounds per pannier. Rather than the, than the pair, which uh, what I managed to source, so I was over the moon. Plus they came from Germany, which just added that, that little bit of uh, extra for the bike, knowing that they literally came direct from Germany itself. Oh, I think it might be not an accident, just a heavy load. Heavy load coming through. What we got here? Yep, you're not kidding, that is a heavy load. Wow, that thing's mahusive. Yep, wouldn't want to get into an argument with that. So once I got all the bits and pieces, work began and uh, Toby and I start getting work done and uh, yeah everything started to fall into place <laughs> fine don't wave then honestly rude and uh, the, the minute the fairing was put in place and uh, the panniers were put on the, the bike became what it is now it's just it all fell into place it looked amazing transformation 
was immediate. And uh, then the policing and the fettling started happening. I managed to flip this tank. I'm so proud of the tank. Hours and hours and hours of polishing. I know uh, particularly special uh, tools or equipment for that are just straight up turtle wax on, uh, on the tank and just multiple, multiple layers. And it's come up like no one's business. It looks fantastic. It's one of my favorite bits on the bike. It looks so good. Every time I open my garage, you can see the, the sun reflecting off it and it just looks brilliant. So all those hours were worth it. So yeah, so all in all, I think it took, I don't know, four or five months of work on the bike itself. I started doing um, a lot of work on uh, spraying the uh, bar ends right there. I need to do those again because I learned a lot from that. Which led on to the final piece I was looking for for the bike, which is the belly pan. And that took me forever to find. But finally I found one, again on eBay. It was listed and relisted. And I bidded for it, lost, and then I won it on the second time through some direct messaging with the guy. Yeah, I think he put it on there for like 120, I offered 80. Finally I think I got it for 90 or 100, something, something like that. And it was in royal blue and it's got a big metal bash plate underneath it which I really like but obviously that is not standard <laughs> uh, but it was the wrong colour so I bought it with the full intention of uh, respraying it and that is one of my proudest achievements outside of the polish of the tank on this bike today because I have spent literally weeks and weeks and hours and hours and hours stripping that uh, belly pan down, sanding it all the way back priming it, spraying it, clear coat, and I am so pleased with the end result. If you get up really close to it, yeah sure you can see imperfections. It's not it's not done in a in a clean environment, you know, it's done in my garage with me with spray cans. However, you know, in a car park, you you wouldn't know, you know, it looks really good. It's got a really great finish on it, a really nice clear shine. And I'm very proud of it, and it makes me smile more knowing that I did that, you know, I, I, uh, I took that upon myself to do. So, that is a summary of everything <laughs> I've done on the bike. I mean, I logged it all, obviously, in the Project Flying Brick videos, which, uh, yeah, please check out, I'll put a link up there, or there. And, uh, yeah, it's an interesting ride, that. Which brings me to uh, riding the thing, which uh, only happened at the beginning of this year when it got MOT'd. Which again, can be seen in uh, one of my vlogs, simply labelled the K100RS. And if you haven't checked that out, that's a fun video, so uh, I'll put again a link there or there. And now I've come to terms with it a little bit more, now I've calmed down and got used to it. And this bike is just phenomenal to ride. This engine is just sublime. It's got so much power and it pulls and pulls and pulls. And the, the beauty of it is that you don't have to redline it to get all that power out. It's such a classy lady. She really is. So much class. So smooth, so comfortable and civilized, I think is the, the right word. And a pleasure to ride. And that's what I like about it. And it's a big grin here to here. Uh, when riding it. I was plowing down here on the dual carriageway slash motorway and I was I, I didn't even think about it. I just I, I realized I was plowing along at like 70, 75, 5,000 revs and uh, I was happy as Larry. You know comfortable, no buffeting, really protected with this uh, fairing and I was in the outside lane. I, all the things that uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily associate with a bike that's 30 plus years old. It's crazy absolutely crazy but that's what makes this bike so special and the significance of this bike which again I'll touch on in a moment was huge for BMW it was a it was a bold step to make this bike and initially you know it, it, it had a mixed reception but the the way it's developed and the cult following it has now and it's progressing with that <laughs> that following as I just said earlier with the, the uh, custom scene it's, uh, it's exciting, but I have to admit that I've got a soft spot for its original its original shape with all the fairing on it. I think it looks fantastic, but again, I'm pretty biased. 
I'm hoping you can make out the uh, engine noise on this this video because that's the other uh, area that I really love. She just purrs. This is the first uh, inline four uh, I have ever ridden or, of any shape or version. You know, any guys of uh, of a flat four. And it's just fantastic. The noise always makes me smile. You know, the overrun and the. Uh, changing it up oh it's just fantastic always makes you smile so many things to like about this bike and so few things to dislike oh what a pretty day so pleased i came out <laughs> i was talking to my dad the other day and uh, about this bike and uh, i was talking to him about thinking about taking it out uh, to the peaks but the weather was looking a bit iffy so uh, i took the uh, gs in the end and he totally got it he said it better than i ever could uh, the K100 deserves to go out in nice weather, and it's it's true. <laughs> it's so true. I'm never going to take this bike out in the rain or moody weather, you know. Well, at least try not to. She's earned the right to just enjoy sunny days, and I'm proper chuffed to be owning. Uh, take two, and I'm proper chuffed to own this bike. I'm very proud of it. I think um, on the rarity side, it is pretty rare. I mean, I saw a couple of them at the uh, TT last year. And occasionally you see a, an RT going around, the touring version. But they're, they're not, they're pretty few and far between. And uh, there's a great website. And I'll uh, f find what it is. Fine, don't nod. Oh man, these are moody. Yeah. Moody bikers, honestly. What is up with the world? Why are people not anymore? Um, what was I saying? What was I saying? What was I saying? La 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 la. Yes, uh, there it is. The uh, rarity of this bike is something to take of note. As I said, there is a few of them in the TT and occasionally you see the RTs. And uh, there's a website that I'll put up on the screen now um, that I found out how many of these are actually registered on the road at the moment. I think there was around, I, can't, I wish I could bloody remember, I should have done that before I came out, but it's low. I think in all of the United Kingdom, oh, there was around 200, uh, around 200 of these registered on the road, of course, of which this is one, which uh, adds to the, the special factor, the wow factor of this bike. Oh, great section of twisties. You might notice that my clocks are steaming up right now. <laughs> it makes me smile. It's uh, one of the flaws of the bike that's well known is that the heat from the uh, the brick comes up from the from down there up towards your legs and your clocks, causing that condensation. <laughs> so uh, when I get to the yonder bit, it'll uh, allow it to cool down a bit. <laughs> makes you smile. I mentioned it at the end of the last video about the additional things I want to get done on this bike because the project's not done. And that's the beauty of having a bike like this is that you can carry on working on it. So key things uh, for this winter, I can sort out those, the mirror housings because it's got a whole bunch of scratches on those that I uh, desperately want to sort out. Also the mirror on the left hand side housing is magnified. This one on the right is normal, but that one's magnified, so it's a distorted view of what's going on behind me, which is never great. So that's going to get replaced. On top of that, I want to uh, sort out my centre stand and side stand, as they're uh, pretty rusted up, and it bugs me. <laughs> so I kind of want to get that sorted. There's also a service that uh, Keith told me about, that you can have all the bolts nuts and bolts replaced on the bike so to, for new shiny ones and I'm very keen to have that done and uh, what was the other one? I had another one no it's gone <laughs> but they're the, they're the moments oh yes tyres I need to get new tyres on, uh, on the bike and eventually one day when I have enough money I like to have the, the frame looked at now I, I locked out with the frame the bike's frame is really good but there uh, are uh, some signs of, uh, of age on there that I'd like to get sorted out now rather than later 
before it gets any worse, you know? And I'm sure that'll be expensive, so... In fact, if there is anyone out there that knows of a, a service that can look after or restore a frame, let me know. Put comments below. We're coming into the Alderman, which is good because I'm getting hungry. Oh, you're from the Alderman. Oh, full of bikers. Um, where do I want to go? Lots of GSs. We'll pop it here. Lovely, lovely. Excellent. So let's go and get some food. Oh. Look at that. Prime example of custom K100 action right there. It's got the can on it. Interesting. He's cut the frame there. Wow. What are the odds? Very cool. And here's the original. <laughs> Always makes me smile coming back to this bike because I think she's a looker. Okay, so that was the Onderman, and I'm all fueled up, ready for the rest of the journey. Wish uh, the guy that owned that was uh, knocking about. I would love to have said hello to him or her. So let's get this rocking and rolling. Boom. So there it is, folks. The Onderman. I've said it once, I've said it a million times. If you're in the area, check this place out. It is fantastic. Particularly if you are a biker. Okay. Bakewell. No, I've got to tell you before I forget, I was uh, sitting outside there having a, a delightful bacon and egg cob when I was approached by a guy called Rob. Rob, if you're watching this, hello. It was delightful meeting you. And uh, he came up to me and said, do you have a YouTube channel? Are you, are you the map guy? <laughs> He said he recognised my voice when I was on the phone and uh, he, uh, he's been watching the uh, NC500 videos of uh, the adventure Toby and I undertook back in 2017 and uh, he's uh, been watching them all of last week and what are the odds that uh, we would bump into each other 
<laughs> today. And that's made a, put a big smile on my face. <laughs> it's so strange being uh, being recognised or being approached and being asked. I, I, you know, I knew the guy from that. But uh, I'm particularly flattered because he's undertaking the, uh, or at least some parts of the route, which uh, Toby and I took, and he's used it as a bit of a guide. I think he's uh, looked at a number of different videos doing sim the similar route, and uh, yeah, he's uh, he's used uh, used our NC500 adventure as a bit of a template. It's a bit of a teepee over there. Ooh, very cool. So yeah, that's quite cool. Anyway, back onto the bike. So I've told you a bit about the history of it with me and how it makes me feel. But let's give you some uh, some facts and stats. So it has a 22 litre tank, has five gears, has a shaft drive, approximately about 90, uh, 90 brake horsepower, uh, which pushes out about 135 miles an hour top end when it was new. <laughs> it is of course uh, an inline four, flat four, and it has two valves per cylinder uh, on, on this particular bike. Later on it brought in four, uh, four valves to make it a little bit more smoother. So there we go, there's a bit, bit of stats for you. Uh, the bike itself came in at the, in the early 80s, uh, approximately 83 and ran through to about 92 I again I believe approximately so I had a very good run and uh, it's uh, a significant bike as I've said for a number of reasons it came in at a time where BMW couldn't compete with the, the huge increase of Japanese bikes that were hitting the market with all the power and economy and uh, uh, more importantly emissions uh, that they were they were kicking out because the, the boxer engine, air-cooled boxer engine that they've been using on all of their bikes for so many years was um, really showing its age and it needed to produce something that uh, shook everything up and uh, they decided in their infinite wisdom to bring out something that wasn't in direct competition with the Japanese bikes with, uh, with power, uh, red lining, uh, high revving, uh, fire breathing bikes but decided to uh, produce something that could bring a uh, relative power and more importantly usable power at uh, a much more elegant pace so you we don't have to redline it but still keep up with those boys on uh, on the Japanese alternatives so they looked at many different options and approximately about 1977 a very clever German guy I can't remember his name but I'll put it up on the screen pitched an idea of using an engine from a Peugeot 106 um, or was it a 104? God, I, it's terrible really, shouldn't, I shouldn't remember all this stuff and uh, took the engine from that to adapt it for their new bike and from those humble beginnings the Flying Brick was launched now we got that moniker, the Flying Brick from what I just said earlier so it um, wasn't designed at all to uh, compete with the inline fours of uh, of uh, that, that, that blah, 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 blah. it wasn't designed to uh, compete with the Japanese inline fours of its era because it uh, BMW didn't see any point in doing that they they wanted to produce a bike that could could be on the same uh, plateau but to offer uh, an alternative by uh, bringing that same kind of performance but at a more elegant pace so you don't have to redline it and you can still get the same amount of power but as I've just mentioned it was all about usable power for, uh, for touring or sport touring the other angle of the bike was that uh, it was incredibly easy to work on something that we uh, have moved away from in modern bikes which is a bit of a pity and a lot of their advertisements were based on the accessibility to the engine, to all the valves, the cylinders, and so on and so forth, uh, enabling you, if you wish, to get your hands dirty in and uh, get the best and most out of your uh, your motorcycle, which has led onto the renaissance of this machine, 
in more recent years on the custom scene very eloquently displayed by the bike that we saw outside of uh, the Yonderman. This bike lends itself so well to the custom market uh, so much so now that there are a number of different kits like pre-made for it if you wanted to go down that route but the bike simply uh, comes apart uh, with ease I mean uh, literally anybody with a few basic tools and the relevant space can uh, pull this bike apart and start hacking away at it to produce whatever they want and it's been used for very sexy cafe races uh, scramblers you name it it's, uh, it's had for those variants and it lends itself so well because that bike is the center sorry scratch that that engine is the centerpiece to, to the to, and heart of all those custom custom builds and more to the point it's a very very viable option in comparison to the R series whereas the R R100 R80 um, in, in, they're in such high demand uh, for those bikes for customs that you just can't get hold of them um, not within reasonable money anyway whereas you can pick these bikes up really cheap and go to town on them you know as I've said I picked this bike up for £1,200 and uh, it was already a, a runner you know and hence why I thought when I picked mine up it, it was it was that fine line between you know it wasn't a, a nutter dog um, and not you know ratty and tatty enough to feel good about tearing it apart for a custom hence why I went with the, the you know to restore it because I just didn't have the heart to rip it rip it apart when it when it looks so good and I think I made the right decision but I would have no reservations of picking up another one if it was at the right uh, right price and to do a, a project on that because you know like that one outside uh, the, the Onderman it looked mean and it's relatively easy to do so yeah mm, tempted tempted about that in regards to the, the models themselves there was a number that came out so there was the original K100 in all of its glory then uh, the K75 that was a uh, triple I believe and uh, then the K100 RS came out as well as the K100 RT not as pretty as the K100 in my opinion but that was designed for touring the T stood for touring and the S stood for sports with uh, with this one and later on down the line with the introduction of, t uh, of four valves per cylinder came the K1 and that was a very exciting bike for its time I believe that was the most aerodynamic machine of its era yeah crazy looking machine but oh so cool the K series of course is still running today but looking all far more sexier than <laughs> arguably more sexier than uh, these machines but no I don't know why I said that actually I love this bike I think it looks amazing but it's very much the sport tourer and uh, I've seen this bike referred to as the gentleman's sport tourer and I get that do you feel very uh, special riding these bikes and it's so ahead of its time all the gadgets and gizmos on this I mean mine, mine doesn't have half of them on there but I've got the gear indicator and that's really cool we've got a lovely clock here we've got a two stage fuel system a uh, fuel indicator light I should say but it doesn't work <laughs> and uh, other models had uh, ABS in the later years as well as heated grips very clever but the aerodynamics on this bike were one of the key things that set it apart from uh, from all the competitors I think what the bike in total if you looked at it back in the day is that it was one of the first to combine the inline four liquid cool engine shaft drive really really ahead of its time di uh, aerodynamics all together in one package it was the first one to do that all at the same time which what made it so special but like you would expect it wasn't a, a massive success to initially there was the BMW faithful who would still didn't want to steer away from the boxer engine but eventually they did and it became a very big success I hope that information helped I mean it's a bit scattered there and lots of ohs and ohms so sorry about that but I, I think the, the history of this machine is really interesting oh man we've got gridlock Another unusual feature on this bike has got its monoshock rear suspension and it's on the right hand side of the bike which is quite unusual when you take the panniers off it does look quite strange 
but in regards to performance, it's nothing to worry about because it's such a comfortable bike to be on. It really eats up the bumps and lumps in the road. One thing I should say though, I think I mentioned it on my previous videos, is that obviously there's no telelever suspension. So when you apply the brakes, there is a massive dip at the front, which is, uh, took me a while to get used to. Very, very peculiar having the front of the bike nosedive. <laughs> scared the bejesus out of me. We're coming into Chatsworth House now, which is nice. I really like it here. And hopefully I'll be able to find a spot to pitch up and take a photograph. Because that would be nice. Oh, it's such a great machine. I'll tell you one other thing I really love about it. And this is only from a, a modern rider, I guess. Is the, the massive clocks. I love these. I've said it before. <laughs> it look, looks to me like an old uh, pair of diving goggles. That's just fantastic. Massive, clear. You know exactly what's going on. Really good stuff. And a far cry from all the TFT and digital screens that are going on these days. There's certainly a place for it. Look at that, the sun's come out again. Fantastic. Absolutely glorious. What's the sheep? Oh yes, I forgot, all the lambs are out. Look at that, how pretty is that? <laughs> Lots of sunbathing going on there. <laughs> all right, here we go, chats with us. Let's see if I can find a spot. see uh, lots of stuff going on here. Oh, obviously if there's something very big going on here. Oh, it's so pretty, isn't it? Look at it. Look at it! Such a classy place. I'm going to be able to pull up here. Can I get away with that? You know what? I'm going to try and get away with this. And if they ask me to move along, that's exactly what I'll do. There we go. There we go. Okay, let's have a quick drink here before we head back. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, it is gorgeous here. There's a horse jumping, a horse show, whatnot, just over, over there on the other side of the river. And what a glorious day for it. Let's get you one. I'm going to... Boom. Hello. I'm going to push on back home now. Because I've got some editing to do. But before I do that... What a gorgeous dog. <laughs> Let's do a selfie because it has to be done. So let's get home. Sorry fella. <laughs> I think they're following my lead. a bit of an acute angle so hopefully I can lift her up there we go there we have it chats with her Lots of people out today walking their dogs and having picnics out here and rightly so because it's a beautiful day for it.
Okay, let's get out of here. It really has turned out to be a fantastic day. I've lucked out with the weather. I'm so pleased I uh, made the effort to come out. So, as I'm making my way back, I'll give you my final thoughts, I guess, and final impressions on, uh, on my BMW K100 RS. So, as you uh, can probably gauge, I'm pretty taken with it. I think it's a, just a brilliant, I think it's a, uh, just a really solid uh, retro bike. It's just so much fun. And in, a, in an age where we're full of gadgets and gizmos and crazy TFT screens, this uh, brings you back to uh, what biking was all about back in the day, where it has no gadgets, nothing. This bike has nothing on it. You know, and uh, going from something like a GS with every single toy you can imagine on it to this is so uh, so uh, so liberating. I want to say because um, it uh, brings you back to the, the roots of biking, and uh, I really enjoy that because it just gives you that grin factor, you know. And that's what you want from any kind of bike. It's the grin factor, making you smile. And this bike makes me smile every time I open the garage. It's just, it's just brilliant, and that is priceless. You could pick these things up really cheap these days. The parts for them are plentiful. There's so many sources uh, for them, and, and the, the community out there are brilliant, really supportive, and um, loads of ideas of what you can do with them. And the ride is just spot on. Whatever else you think about the bike, the way it looks, if you find a good one, it's so much fun to ride it. That engine is just sublime, it just pulls and pulls and pulls and so civilised when doing it too. And that's the party piece about it, it's a civilised bike. As I said at the top of the, the video, she's a classy lady that will pick up a skirt and go when you want it to. Yeah, BMW made something very special here and I count myself very lucky to own one. Like with every bike, you know, it's not it's not perfect, she has her flaws, but uh, I think if you ask any biker, those flaws are just character. <laughs> but I, what I love about this is that it gives me that retro feeling, it uh, gives me that sporty feeling too. But also, with the panniers on the back, I'm able to go anywhere I want without worrying about you know, bringing uh, a bag or a rucksack or anything like that. And that's just brilliant, you know. But just sitting there, just tipping into these corners, it's so much fun. So, would I recommend the bike? You bet your bottom dollar I would. <laughs> it's a stonking machine. It gives you miles of smiles for a relatively cheap entry fee. Oh, look at that, isn't that beautiful? Stunning. So yeah, thoroughly recommend it. Recommend it for uh, restoring, for projects, even for day-to-day -day commuting if you wanted to have a, a daily hack to get in and out of work. It's got a lot to offer this bike and I love them. And uh, so much character. Oh, it's so pretty. So pretty. I feel I should be uh, listening to uh, Huey Lewis in the, in the news or maybe a bit of Phil Collins or something when riding this bike. Get that proper 80s vibe. Maybe some wham. <laughs> bit of George Michael. So, that's about it. I'm going to wrap things up there. I hope you enjoyed uh, this impressions video. I hope I've managed to uh, portray a reasonable representation of this bike. And uh, there'll be lots more videos, I'm sure, of me and this bike coming up. If you have any questions about it, just uh, leave comments below. And I'll uh, come back to you the best I can, because I, I am no means an expert. <laughs> But uh, I can certainly tell you what I think and anything else on that, you know, the matter of this bike and the experiences with it. And she's, uh, she's no slouch. 
<laughs> yeah, comfy, loads of power, great looks in my opinion, and uh, very affordable. So, ticking a lot of boxes there. So, if you're looking for a, that new bike or that second bike in your garage, take, uh, take a look at the K100. I think you might be surprised about what, uh, what it can offer you, or specifically the K100 RS because uh, that's the, the better option in my opinion. So, without further ado, I'm going to wrap it up. Hey boys, hey boys, hey boys. Don't say hello then, it's fine. <laughs> Honestly, not many people saying hello back today. Okay, for the third time. Yes, I'm going to wrap things up there. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed this ride. So, uh, I'm glad that you've come along to watch it. We'll be back again real soon. Probably uh, the next kind of coverage will be the uh, the TT itself. Because that's only like, I don't know, two weeks away. So that's come up really quick. And uh, all the prep for the bikes will be coming up soon. And yeah, before you know it, we'll be on that ferry heading over to the Isle of Man. Which is very exciting. So uh, until then, I hope you all ride safe. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. That always helps. And obviously, feel free to comment below. And we'll be back again real soon. So until then, take care. And we'll, uh, we'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.